tattoo versus a drawing of a nude model in a, a, an art studio or whatever. It might seem like night and day, but you're, you're learning, you know, important things about flow and proportion and that kind of thing from uh, just drawing the human figure. It's actually a great, uh, great practice for anyone who is just wanting to expand their art skills in general. Get yourself in front of a figure model once a week and you will absolutely guaranteed see a improvement in your work. Start out not being able to draw the figure very well and by your third or fourth week you're already going to, to feel uh, forward progress. So we just waiting for them to come back with the stencil now? Is that where we're at? Or are you still sending? It's sent. Okay. We could uh, keep drawing or take a break. Well, Whatever we could look want. at menus and uh, we've got a little bit more drawing to do here. Okay. And, um, get the stencil on it's here still before we actually... up in wires over here. Just disconnect the smallest one from where it connects. You should be free. <laughs> Looking cool. Yeah, if you could come around and look over my shoulder, you'd get a better sense. But I'm trying to make wow. it sort of gradually get more more organic as we get farther away. So like the leading edge of of all the ornament huh. is gonna be a little bit more you know, smooth oh, yeah. and Yeah, have it, and part of it is, is having these uh, things fuse with the background, you know, like the points of these leaves. And obviously, we don't want to do it with all of them, but um, you can see like this leaf here came off and you've got this yeah. thing happening down there. This is to sort of capitalize off the Achilles tendon. I was going to carry that down it's a little farther. Like archaeologists are chipping away at yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the rocky stuff and discovering mm -hmm. this shiny metal underneath. Yep. And uh, Russ, how do you feel about our live audience members once we actually get rolling, um, being able to actually stand and hover over us a little yeah. bit? That's, that's cool. Once we actually start tattooing, um, you're all invited to, uh, you know, think, think of it in terms of uh, being at a tattoo convention, you know, how close you would normally get to a booth or whatever. That's totally cool. We want you to, the fact that you're here in, in person live, you know, the pe people who are tuning in, uh, online are actually getting a great view, you know, they're getting the over-the-shoulder camera view. So uh, those of us uh, who are here live might need to actually come up closer to, to see as well as the people who are uh, tuning in. all the folks at home that are reposting this on Instagram and sharing this with everyone yeah please continue with that too you know it's uh, this has been really uh, we've had had some great community support here but a lot of people still don't know about this and especially today's portion which is, is free to the public um, you know we're not going to be getting super technical today uh, since it is uh, open to the public can you give this another spray please um, and you know not a professionals only audience we're not going to be talking about the uh, uh, the exact nuts and bolts aspects of you know how we've got our machine set and things like that we're going to go deep into that stuff tomorrow though and uh, so for those of you who are tuning into the free webcast today uh, if you uh, buy tickets for tomorrow's uh, webcast you will actually be uh, signed up to be part of the raffle because we are giving away two of these uh, 
uh, these tablets. The, the Cintiq Companions, uh, Wacom has set aside two of them for, uh, for these raffles. And you know, those of you who have already bought tickets, there will be a drawing uh, later today um, to find today's winner. And then there will be another drawing tomorrow. Uh, it's a thousand dollar tablet. Uh, and I can tell after, you know, even just my first day of using it, uh, this is, the thing is going to get a ton of use. I'm probably going to be retiring my non-display tablet. I can't imagine why I would use that now that uh, I'm empowered with this. And for uh, anyone interested who uh, isn't planning on, uh, uh, well, you should definitely wait and see if you win the tablet first, but uh, um, there's a promotion code. Uh, that Wacom has uh, um, activated. It's good for about 10 days from now um, that I mentioned earlier, tattooed hyphen G-R-W-E-B. And you can find that. Uh, is it on the bottom of the screen, Ben? I can put it up. OK, yeah, we want it's that promotion code on the screen. Too. Yeah, it has to be all caps. Um, so yeah, Ben's going to put that promo code up. Uh, they have temporarily lowered the prices on some of their uh, models and they're also offering an additional 50 to 100 depending on which model you get off using this promotion code and uh, so for instance uh, their lowest end model which is normally a $1,200 tablet you can get for a thousand um, which is a, a tremendous deal I remember when the Cintiq first appeared on the market it was a pretty high-end device and uh, like I said I would have I would have eventually taken the plunge uh, if not for having this enormous and very expensive computer meltdown last year um, where I had to rebuy everything. Can you tell me what that was? Code? What's that? What was the promo code? Uh, tattoo, uh, all, all caps, hyphen G-R-W-E-B. This far back on here, I'm just going to have a hint of some sort of vertical movement, like it's kind of going with the, mm -hmm. the ankle bone there, but it'll be pretty much all in shadows. Cool. When you think about how these structures incorporate into that a little bit, it's kind of flat right now. Yeah, well, you want to uh, take a crack at it? Maybe they just have a bevel going down the center of them. Or Something well, this ties is in, in an interesting way. Oh, you mean these these guys? Yeah. Yeah, they need something. Well, if I were thinking in my sort of default uh, biomech kind of uh, language, it would be something along these lines. And you know, so much of, of the bio thing, for me anyway, has, has been, I mean, I've, I've taken a huge amount of influence just looking at architecture, for instance. I've got sp sketchbooks that are full of <coughs> drawings that I've taken of, you know, bridge abutments and, you know, cool old buildings. Especially Chicago is so filled with, uh, um, you know, Are we on camera right now? I got him, Johnny. Uh, your hands are. Okay. So, yeah, what, as you can, uh, can all see, we're uh, positioning this stencil. We've chosen the size that we like, and uh, Russ has just made some register marks on there. And I think he's going to actually do a little bit of redrawing. I'll yeah. This out of Go ahead. Way. When uh, Brian stood up, I could see that I wasn't really happy with some of the flow up in this region and also a little bit of this area was bugging me so I'm gonna wipe it and okay do you want to stand him up again. for sketching it on him 
Yeah, that would probably be good. Let's get this out of the way. I need some. Okay. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's just hope for the best with this table. Big giant surfboard. Yeah. Just one little thing. Actually, I can do a couple of things here. How long you can hold that? Me? All right, I'll get out of your hair. So we're going to keep Brian standing as long as we can. <laughs> it's a slightly awkward position for him, but it really gives us a better sense of how this works on his leg. <laughs> yeah, well, it sort of is. <laughs> Here you want. Oh, you got the pink one. And one of the things I'm doing back here is making sure we've got enough elements that sort of, I don't, want to have a seam here you know like this mm -hmm. Achilles tendon stuff I like the idea of putting it all there but I'm going to erase half of it so that when we uh, do the inside part of the the calf we can have some things that are overlapping into it a little bit more all right armrest has arrived So yeah, we've decided we're going to uh, extend Brian's leg out from the table a little bit onto an armrest, so that'll give us a little bit more access to it. Well, as they say in chaos theory, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And you were drawing on top of some jacked up ornament sketch that I put there. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think the real issue was that he wasn't standing when we drew it. Yeah. You know? I couldn't see some of those. I couldn't see it from the right angle. But uh, I'm a lot happier with that. Yeah, that flows really nicely. Yeah, I can see it. It looks like it evolves. Yes, please. 
more appropriately space-wise. Yep. There's a uh, plastic wrap over there, Joe. There's some plastic. We have some dental bibs as well. All right, so the way that this little thing here attaches, it's kind of a up-facing up plane. It's okay. And there's a ridge right there. That's well, I figured we could have like on top of it. I figured mm -hmm. we'd have a real kind of a thin bevel along this edge here. Okay. Like this, so you can uh -huh. kind of see so the So that shadow from that bevel. Right, and that yeah. makes it obvious that this is a top plane. Mm -hmm. And then they can have a little bit more, like it can widen out here where mm -hmm. it, that kind of a thing. Now, because we know we're going to be adding on to this piece later, and we know the kind of stuff we're doing, but we don't know the exact flow and that sort of thing, um, there's a lot of things that we're just putting big drop shadows underneath and that sort of thing, knowing that we're going to be able to uh, bring future elements into it seamlessly. It's one of the things that, um, and you know, m maybe everyone who uh, does large work eventually finds this the same answer, but doing this, uh, the Biomex stuff for so many years, I've found that uh, it's best to just leave everything sort of open to expansion, you know, just, just never put a hard edge on a design because, um, you know, the person is probably going to end up adding on to it. And, uh, in many cases, somebody's going to start out with a half sleeve, just not feeling like they're ready to commit to a sleeve. And then by the time you're two thirds of the way done with the half sleeve, they've already got plans for down to the knuckles. And at that point, it's like, well, it's a good thing I left it open to expansion. Yeah. Or if you're like Gekko here, it's down to the fingernails. <laughs> so uh, for everyone who's tuned in, uh, we are uh, going to be having a little bit of an Instagram repost contest. We're going to start up in a little bit here. We'll be posting the, the image for it uh, shortly. And uh, we're offering three prizes. for uh, This is basically for whoever, uh, you know, three people who get the, the most reposts going there. We're going to um, be uh, giving away a $100 uh, tattoo uh, now gift certificate for uh, anyone who uh, gets tattooed here or uh, any of the services that they sell. Uh, I think more details will be available at their uh, website. Uh, $100 gift certificate for uh, Tattoo Education. That's, that's my educational website, and we've got tons of amazing stuff there, uh, including a number of professionals-only items. And um, we ha also have a lot of great $100 items, including uh, DVDs from some of the, the top educators in our industry. And then uh, the other, uh, which I think is a really appropriate prize for today, uh, is from Ross, and that's a copy of Ornamental Archive. It's a, a signed copy, and uh, that's the book we were talking about earlier. That's a uh, you know amazing uh, uh, resource uh, just for reference purposes, but also gives you a little bit of theory and that kind of thing on how to draw this stuff. And uh, that's a signed copy. So anyway repost and uh, we will uh, be announcing the winner later today we'll probably end up doing something like that tomorrow as well but today's the big day we're trying to get you all tuned in here okay all right it's an off the mat gift certificate sorry not tattoo now uh, and uh, yeah information is at hashtag guy Russ collab Should I start inking in these guys? Yeah, they're good to go. And then I guess after that we sh should maybe uh, pop that stencil into place while we're uh, while we've got them standing up. Okay. So I'm hoping that you're all getting more out of this than just how to collaborate, because although we are collaborating today, the you know the fundamentals of what we're doing as tattoo artists are uh, going to apply to every kind of project. 
But if you've got questions about collaboration, please share them. It's, it's something we're seeing a lot more artists doing these days. I find it very exciting because, you know, my first collaborations were, you know, in my very first year of tattooing with people like Eddie Deutsch and Marcus Pacheco. And uh, uh, I just learned so much. Not only that, it's just fun, you know. Um, but uh, if you want to really broaden your uh, vocabulary or, you know, if, if there's another artist who you admire and, and they like what you're doing, you can kind of play around in each other's styles a little bit without it being like you're ripping them off or whatever. And, and you take home what you can from it. And I've definitely found that uh, when I collaborate with somebody else and, you know, I ex get to experiment with their visual language, when I do my own thing with it later, it's still my own thing, you know? It's not like my work is suddenly going to look like theirs. Uh, that's part of the beauty of it all. I found that, you know, let's, let's say you want to inject some kind of new element into your work and you find a reference that you really like and uh, you uh, start doing a design with that reference in mind. You're thinking, okay, this is going to be radically different from my normal work. And it isn't. You know, what ends up happening is that reference will give a little bit of gravita gravitational pull to, to what you're doing. It'll kind of yank it off in a slightly different direction from what you would normally do. But, you know, at the end of the day, you back off, you look at it, and it's still going to be your work. It's still going to be more or less what you would have done on that day of your career regardless. But it's going to have a little bit of something extra that you've invited in. So it's kind of the same way with uh, collaborating. I'm OK. Thanks. Yeah, I've actually got a few collaborations going on by mail right now, which is sort of fun. Uh, artists who have come to visit. Brian here is actually one of them. The one that he and I are doing is on the easel right now. Got one going with Adam France and one with uh, Craig Driscoll. And these are paintings that we started together while we were in, you know, in the same place. And then uh, started shipping it back and forth after that. And that's been a lot of fun. You know, the, the key thing is just sort of uh, being on the same page, you know. Uh, there should be surprises that happen, but if there's enough communication at the beginning of the project, whether it be on skin or on canvas, uh, you don't have to worry about what kind of weird directions it might go off in because you've already communicated that. I think that's a lot of, you know, making a collaboration succeed, is just making sure that that communication is there, making sure that you're both, you know, more or less seeing the same thing in your mind's eye before you uh, dive too deeply into it. <coughs> it's also important that there's, there's enough, I guess, mutual respect between the two artists. I mean, it, it would seem silly if, uh, to even take on a collaboration with somebody who you didn't have a strong respect for, but uh, I've heard stories. And it, you know, becomes a contest where the you know, artists are competing to see who can have the greatest influence over the piece. And that's silly. That's defeating the purpose, you know. The idea is, is to try to find that meeting place right in the middle between the two styles. It's kind of like having another artist in the room who can only exist when you and, and that uh, other person are working together. It, it kind of creates a third artist that uh, is a, a fusion. and. Uh, that's the magic of it. Okay. Um, so, what was the very first thing that you did once you decided you wanted to collaborate? What was the like the step number one? Oh uh, well, you know, I mean, it started when I was a kid and having a brother and sister that also were artistic, and you know, so by the time I was an adult, I'd already done so much drawing with them that the idea of passing something around and and you know the different parties handling different parts of the project. It was kind of second nature. But, but oh, for this. Well, OK, we, uh, um, well, we first started by talking, like, what are the elements we're going to be doing? Um, and uh, this was at a point when Russ had just posted a couple of particularly awesome um, ornamental pieces. And I was just looking at him thinking, man, I would love to just draw on that and get, get a little mecky with it, you know? Um, and next thing I know, I'm sending Russ this long text. And uh, 
one thing led to another. So we had we had the idea for what the elements were going to be. You know, he was also doing these these interesting uh, dimensional kind of uh, geometric things at, at the time, starting to experiment with those. And so uh, it just seemed like a no-brainer that we would fuse the ornament and the um, the biomech and then work in a couple of these geometric elements because that was kind of like just uh, tapping into the cooler aspects of what we were both up to at that time. So that's wh where it all started. And uh, Brian had somebody shoot some pictures of his leg from multiple angles. And uh, you might have seen when we were working on the, uh, the tablet uh, in some of the earlier parts of the day. And we'll, we'll pull these up again. Um, but Russ then took the, I, I did some rough sketches in those photos. And then, then Russ took those uh, sketches and started doing a little doodling in one of those. And, uh, Got it to a point where it was about here, you know, and uh, we also did some uh, emailing back and forth in advance to figure out what uh, graphic elements to, to do the, the 3D thing with. Um, and part of that was influenced by, you know, Brian having this uh, flower, well, he's, his studio is called Flower of Life Studio. And uh, so we started looking at graphics of that, and Brian sent us some stuff. And I did a little playing around with, with other graphics. And you know, we kept some things and discarded some things. And uh, I mean, just like you saw Russ erase and, and redraw some stuff. Now, just assume when you're doing anything like this that there's going to be, if you don't throw some stuff away, you're not working hard enough. You know what I mean? I mean, maybe you'll sit down and start drawing, and everything will go so smoothly that there, it would just wouldn't make any sense to throw anything away. But that's kind of reworked all this. this yeah, much this clearer piece flow that was that. coming down here was getting a little bit of a kink in it when yep. it turned certain ways. So yep. I sort of I really like this whole ankle area. And then yeah. turned it in a little bit more. Yep. Looking great. Let's mm -hmm. see how the stencil fits now. I think we're almost at that point. Mm -hmm. I just need to re rework that part. Yep. Okay. Well, you want to do that first and then we'll uh, get well, that stencil. Go ahead if you want. Okay. I think we need Brian at a more like neutral bus stop kind of uh, okay. stance for that one. Okay, give me a sec. Yeah, and then I, when you're done with that, I'd love to cheese this to the knee. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what that is, but... Well, well, I know it is. <laughs> well, imagine if you Just took... To the knee. Imagine oh, if you took the top part of this, if this were made out of, like, you know, whatever, tin, uh -huh. and you just stuck it in tar, and then smacked it up against his knee and then <laughs> pulled it back a little bit. That sounds perfect. <laughs> Do you need some cheese points here? Can you, are you going to uh, cheese off this? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just, find natural places cheesy? to cheese okay. off of it. And I, I may also like some of these leaves. I might give them like a second separating back layer and that kind mm -hmm. of thing so that we can still keep some of the really nice structured stuff without it turning too organic. There is definitely, you know, uh, being a person that plays around with the organic stuff a lot, and I'm sure anybody that follows me on Instagram or, or whatever has seen me do some intensely detailed, textured sort of things. And there is such a thing as too much, you know. Uh, I always try to uh, have a few elements that are open and clear and smooth, uh, large elements with uh, a fair amount of openness to them, so the piece doesn't get too densely packed with, with uh, small details. Uh, more is not necessarily better when it comes to detail. Uh, I find it's, it's best to have a few areas that are um, you know, more intensely detailed, uh, some areas that are kind of somewhere in between, and some areas that are relatively simple. How's that? Yeah, I think Want that's great. That? Yep, OK. Brian, can you uh, turn towards me a little bit? Again, uh, perfect.
So after this, it's pretty much just get that stencil on there and pour pigment, right? Yep. That's it. <laughs> yeah, put it in the oven and send you home. Right. Completely painless. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Perfect. We should do this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. I will use my special velvet touch today. Perfect. Russ, I expect to see. Oh yeah, you got <laughs> it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Whatever. cheese onto the shin and then yeah there's this kind of scarred area there so we're not going to want to yeah I think that's fine we can have one smooth thing cutting across that really scarred area now with any kind of abstract bio stuff um, job one is to give it a good relationship with the anatomy so here I am looking for the knobby bones and I'm going to be trying to uh, work with those. You don't want to just pretend something's not there or you're not taking full advantage. Right. And I think that would be the case for, for straightforward ornament too, you know? Mm -hmm. Anything that you're doing that's got this kind of flow where you've got freedom. And of course, any tattoo design, you've got some freedom. You know, if you're doing something that's figurative, you're going to have a little bit less than if you're doing something like this. But you've always got the option of uh, working well with the body. That's always something that uh, is, is worth a little bit of extra effort to just start by looking for the big forms on the body and uh, taking it from there. Which is why we started with the, the f by drawing in photos of the leg. It really helps to see it a lot smaller, doesn't it, before you have yeah. to start extrapolating to this enormous leg. Yeah, at, at this size, you know, it's so easy to uh, start drawing too much detail or start drawing too small or whatever and then end up at a point where you're two hours in and you're like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Or, you, you know, you end up just making it work because you're two hours in and your client has to eventually get home, you know. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, Working on paper, you're just going to think differently, you know? It's, it's almost like a, whatever, for lack of a better term, like a God's eye view because you're seeing it. So you're seeing the whole thing at a glance, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, I think, is... I, I think people are, are tempted to just get out the tracing paper and draw full size, you know? Because they, they figure they're going to save time that way. They're working, you know, with the, the full size, uh, you know, template that they're going to be actually tattooing. But that's not necessarily going to be helpful. Yeah, I'd like to talk a bit about contrast today because uh, I think it's something that's a little bit misunderstood in tattooing. Um, and of course, contrast is, is key, right? I mean, it's what makes something strong. But I think a lot of people have taken it to mean use lots of black in your tattoo. And that's only true if you also have areas where you don't. You know, contrast literally is about difference. So. What I usually try to do is select areas where uh, I know there's going to be heavy black. And I, I plan that ahead of time. I'll, I'll plan it in, in my rough drawings. Uh, you know, at, at the very earliest stages of drawing, I'm already thinking about where my big dark and light areas are. Uh, any chance we could? Where my big dark and uh, light areas are going to be. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, what that ends up translating to is when actually tattooing it, having some areas where you're going to hold back on the black shading and then other areas where you're going to go pretty strong with it rather than having the entire tattoo having a little bit here and a little bit there. That's, that's how you end up with fuzzy looking tattoo work that uh, doesn't look like much from a distance. You know, it might look nice 
rendered up close, but it ends up having that sort of third degree burn look when viewed from far away. And uh, so to avoid that, think, think about where, where your strong blacks are going to be and where they're not going to be. Before we actually pour our pellets, I think we're going to get out the old Abbott color wheel, which uh, some of you may have already uh, gotten familiar with this project by uh, supporting uh, Russ on Kickstarter, in which case, thanks for being part of it. I, I think that this uh, color wheel really is a, a kind of a long overdue thing, which, um, you know, when I first came into tattooing, I was kind of shocked by how little, like, art theory uh, there was in, in the profession, you know, I mean, you couldn't find a lot of people that uh, had much of a grasp of, of traditional art theory. And uh, the idea of a color wheel, like the, the guy that I was working with at the time, uh, Bob Oslin, he uh, brought out a color wheel and, and showed me what it was all about. And it was just a simple thing. And, you know, I, I've kind of included it in uh, my book, Reinventing the Tattoo. Um, but what Russ has done, he's taken it a whole step further, and it's, a, it's an interactive color wheel, a device that you can actually rotate and uh, move parts around and, and uh, figure out color schemes by uh, uh, seeing what it has to, to tell you. There's a number of different ways that you can engage with it, and it actually shows you precise colors uh, in the uh, Eternal palette, that's, that's the pigments we're going to be working with today. Although the wheel can be used for, you know, any brands of pigment. Yeah, I think this is it. Um, well, let's try it. Yeah. Um, good old stencil stuff. Say mm -hmm. <laughs> one. Let's do it. neutral position that you can give us while you're up on the giant surfboard. <laughs> yeah, you're probably a lot more knockoverable right now. Okay, so that was it. I think I might need a little bit more. Give him another dollop. Thank you. So this is sort of a precision stenciling thing here where we're painting the stencil stuff in between these other elements. But regardless, we're oh, it's falling apart. If we need to redo it, we'll have to print another one. But I don't think we're going to need to redo it.
we can draw in when we get there. Yeah, yeah, the bottom. yeah. We're real yeah. close. Um, so anyway, we're talking about the front edge at one point, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is going to be coming in the foreground. Right. Um, or do we know that yet? Should we just leave that? Because we don't know what's going on in here yet? Yeah. Because uh, it could be that there's going to end up being more foreground elements and that's going to be the end of that. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that we decide to make this front edge come out in front of other stuff. Right. But if we just leave it like this, we've got both choices. Yeah, I agree. So, um, yeah, we don't want to close up too many options about, uh, about that. It's a nice sharp stencil. Um, I think I'd like to do a little bit of Mackie Cheese stuff here. You want to uh, lay back down again? Sure. All right. Hell yeah. Look at that thing. Okay. Um, let's see. Can I get a little alcohol, please? Thank you. And yeah, to everyone tuning in, once again, today we're going to be talking about a lot of stuff. You know, we're talking about design prep, we're talking about some digital stuff, we're talking about, you know, some product preferences and things like that. We're really getting technical tomorrow. That's what, uh, we're saving it all for then. Now, of course, today is open to the public, so we don't want to get technical. Um, and uh, please feel free to ask any questions you want, but there may, may be some that we just tell you, um, ask us again tomorrow. Uh, because, you know, anything that's real technical, that's where we're going with. But uh, don't let that stop you from asking. Now, as a general rule, time spent in prep like this might seem like uh, we've put a bit of time into all this fiddling around, but as a general rule, that's going to save you time when you're actually tattooing. Now here's a little thing that, that I like to point out. Okay, so you've got this arc in the stencil. Notice how this leaf that was here already, just from where the stencil landed, it lined up perfectly with that arc. You don't want that. Your foreground and background elements should uh, sit in distinctly different positioning. Um, so in this case, I'm just erasing that top edge there and redrawing it, just so things don't coincide too much. Because it becomes less clear, it becomes actually harder to read when uh, you've got things landing on top of each other like that. So I think we're going to be tattooing within 15 minutes here. I mean, it's, it's looking that way. And uh, probably right before we uh, start, uh, give Brian here one more chance to uh, do whatever he's got to do. And uh, everyone else uh, who's watching, if you need to hit the bathroom or whatever, th that'll be your chance. Uh, and then we're probably going to go about three hours without stopping for uh, the first round. And I'm expecting we're going to end up uh, actually tattooing for a good seven or eight hours today and probably something similar tomorrow. Well, uh, should we have him stand up and look at it from a distance? Sure. Um, yeah. Okay. 
That is mighty cool. There's a thing on the back of the knee I want to alter a little bit. Yeah, you could just come over here, that's fine. Again, just looking for ways to make shapes bigger. So, you know, for instance, this kind of leaf shape here that I just erased, making it a full, like, three-eighths of an inch wider. And what that's going to mean is bigger foreground shapes and smaller background area. And that's another kind of general rule that I uh, kind of stick to is I try to have a relatively high foreground to background ratio, smaller areas of background and more foreground. I think pieces that have too much background tend to look insubstantial and I don't know, it's just it's one of those I guess you could say it's a little bit of a prejudice of mine. We've got a few of those, and I don't know if there's any like sound, uh, you know, art theory behind it. But yeah, the larger foreground, smaller background thing is one of those. Okay, and then Russ, let's talk about lighting. Okay, for yep. instance, these curves here. I'm uh -huh. guessing there's going to be like a place right about here where it kind of comes around to sh right. some shading. So I've, I've heard the term before, shadow core. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, I guess, have a shadow core right about here. And so we'll have our warmer, lighter color above that. We're also going to have the warm glow coming through the pattern. True, yes. I don't know if we want to try to show that hitting uh, along the, the edges, the ornamental surfaces. Yeah, there. yeah. I think that uh, that would just be hitting the very edges. Yeah. So that's where we're going to have like the actual like true oranges and reds. Um, well, should we uh, get ready to demonstrate the color wheel? Or are we at that point? Yeah, sure. Uh, Can you guys use black for that? Um, it depends, you know. I mean, like with this, I think the heaviest black is going to go, you know, in the farthest background. Mm -hmm. But there will definitely be a little bit of black in there. Uh, well, often, <coughs> often what I'll do is, uh, and this this is something a lot more artists are getting comfortable doing, uh, is uh, I'll probably do most of the shading with with lighter colors first, and then I'll come back in and and hit those blacks uh, anywhere that it. Uh, seems to need a little bit of extra emphasis. <coughs> so, uh, all right, so this is a plane facing down. That would be shaded. <coughs> um, okay, so this line, what's that joining with? Because as it stands, it's just kind of disappearing this behind line? there. No, this one oh. here. Um, it Should it join with on. this? Well, it, it continues on, in, but yeah. then it, it doesn't really follow through. So either no, we need to bring it all yeah. the way back here, or we need to have it flow into this. Because I like yeah, the yeah. amount of surface area right. it covers. Uh, yeah, yeah. It doesn't go anywhere, though. So, I mean, we could do this with it. Yeah. Now, that's me thinking Biomac, you know. No, that, that works. Okay. This maybe not such a point right there, maybe a little bit more of a thickness to the whole edge. I'll let you do it. I was also ho hoping that you could clarify exactly what's going on here with that little glitch. Well, what I usually like to do is to have this little little circular element where the two pieces. Oh, I got you. I got you. Meet. Yep, yep. I got you. So that it's kind of got a little ball on it. Uh huh. And, and then, then I sort of build that surface up. Like I'll usually do a highlight that yep. as if it's kind of coming yep, up. And I got a you. Highlight on top. Glad I asked. And that's actually something I could easily steal and incorporate into a lot of the mech stuff that I do, that little extra ball there. Right. Yeah, so there'd be like a highlight falling yep. all the way along that eventually. Yep, like a, a Marcus Lenhard style bevel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know what? Consider it stolen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So this, we're going to bring it up. 
Oh, I got you. I got you. So it's not, not such a. Maybe. What's happening there? Well, I don't think that second no, arc is necessary. Right. Yeah, go, go back in. I think it can just come right back to here where it started. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Let's see. Um, this guy needs a little bit of a twist. Anything else like this that, that uh, I mean, a lot of this we can develop as we We're go. A little rough right here. Yeah. Kind of smooth that out. Yeah, that'll be one of the first things to wipe off. If you want to call out specific things you're looking for, I'll um, I'm going to black. Black, hmm? black and uh, purple concentrate. Ah, there you go. Anything I pour, do you want me to set it out, uh, hand out to sure. you? Uh, purple concentrate, we might have to grab from the shop. Okay. I don't travel with it. Yeah, purple yeah. concentrate in a warm, medium gray if they have it. Yep. I'm pretty reliant on the concentrate. Um, maybe some more Vaseline or something equivalent. I think we have a bunch of that actually. We have oh, do we? we okay, have never mind. Yeah, I think that's it for now. We got the armrest too, right? That's already. Uh, concentrate purple, yeah. Yeah, you can get them set up for the armrest. Oh, nice. Uh, back. You can maybe kick the back legs up and sun set it up on the... Alright, let's focus on the bottom of the stage. Mm -hmm. Um, should probably mix a, a, a light orange too. Move the bottle back a little bit so it's oh, yeah. focused um, Russ, do you have an extra needle bar I can use just as a stirring paddle? Yeah. Or anything sterile? Yeah. Not really. So you got the light red still or did you just put it back? There you go. Yeah, it felt kind of bad. I've been using all my old, uh, my unused sterilized needles as just mixing sticks, but I'm just, you know, no, I'm a cartridge guy. I don't, I can open my case and pull out a needle for you. I should probably just one of these days throw a bunch of toothpicks in the autoclave. It's the kind of thing you just don't think to do. So yeah, I'm pouring this range of muted cools. Yeah, this enchanted lilac, that's one of my favorites. It's sort of a gray lavender. And part of the, like what has gotten me interested in certain colors is uh, I see something that's similar to one of my favorite oil paint colors. I have to try it out. Tempered brass. brass. That's a that's a nice yeah. uh, right in between the uh, sienna and the ochre. I'm 
you know, a lot of colors you can achieve them by dipping, but the more stuff you actually have in your palette, um, the more range you're going to end up with. So you're seeing me do a, a couple things a little differently from what I would normally do. Um, normally I uh, actually put my pellet on a uh, plastic plate and I'll actually have two of them. I'll have one that is uh, for the pellet and another one that uh, I keep underneath it and anytime I'm going to step away I'll put the pellet uh, underneath the second plate. And having it on a plate allows you to kind of rotate and reposition so whatever color you're using you can have closest to uh, the tattoo. I'm a big advocate for, I mean I love wheeled carts because you can get your palette within, you want it to be within 18 inches or so of where you're working. You actually will burn up a lot of time, um, oh, that's a good one, uh, reaching back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. You can even, even uh, you know, wear yourself out a little faster that way. Let's see, a gold yellow. All right, well, I'm pretty good here. Anything that's obviously missing? Some, maybe some more blues? Yeah. yeah maybe uh, something that's more of a, see, they're like a cornflower blue. I guess the slightest blue is a good one. Hey, Soren, since you got no gloves on, could you uh, open up the ink caps right there? And uh, they're in a container right there. And give us each about another three or four of them, just for good measure. You know, something that I've been using is the dipping color for, you know, sometimes you're doing something warm on top and cool on the bottom, but you don't want to go. Uh, let's say you got something that's warm on top and cool on the bottom, and you're trying to, uh, thank you. Uh, kind of narrow that range so it's not too cool on the bottom or whatever. Um, I'll, uh, I'll use like a cool bubblegum pink as, as my dipping color. That's actually a surprisingly effective... Uh, Will something like that work for you? Yep, exactly. And uh, magenta too. I've been using magentas more in, uh, in my background. Magenta is a great mixing color. Yeah, yeah you know, and good, you, good you, you wouldn't think of it that way as a, as a mixing color or a background color. Um, the thing about pink pigments in general is they are uh, not strong pigments. Like if you take a, a, like a dark magenta and put one drop of white in it, it will make a major difference uh, in, in how dark or light it is. Or if you put one drop of white in you know, a concentrate blue, you're barely going to see any difference. Let's see, last thing I'll need is a deep magenta. I think I'll have it. Concentrate. Awesome. Thank you. Just water, yeah. It's, water. <laughs> it's vodka. <laughs> Put the, just a little water in it. Okay. And, uh, I feel pretty good about my palate. Oh, yeah, I'll need something in my rinse cups.
I have no depth perception. I have only one working eye, so I do shit like that all the time. Yep. <clears throat> and don't tell anybody. I'm also <laughs> colorblind, but no one needs to know. <laughs> Your secret's safe. Can you guys hand that armrest over? Oh, yeah. Yeah, how are you guys planning to... Um, well, we were going to try just scooting you down the table. I think we're going to... We, we can push the table all the way up that way. That'll buy us a foot. Yeah. Can I see the back of your leg for a second? Okay. There you go. That's perfect. Yeah, and believe it or not, with two of us working, we can get this thing pretty dialed in in one day. Um, Okay, you want to step off for just a second? Sure. Yeah. There's probably even a way we could kick these legs up and, like, you know, set something up under No, because those will affect these legs. It's the tension between uh, them that, yeah, because yeah, 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 this whole right. thing. Yeah, yeah. So we'll just roll out a little bit if we have to. Okay, well, I'm going to step away for a second, and uh, um, one of us should probably start first. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I guess, uh, Brian, do you need to do anything before we start? I'm going to use the restroom really quick, okay. yeah. All right, everyone, we got 10 minutes, and we'll start.